We're supposed to cut down on fucking animals, you asshole. Now you're telling us that's all you're gonna fucking eat? Plant-based. You need to go plant-based to be healthy. Don't you fucking watch the news? It's gotta be plant-based. Can't you hear what the fucking government's telling us to do? Plants, motherfucker! Eat plants! So, I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome all the vegan haters that are going to swamp my channel for the next month or so, as today is day one of the carnivorous, carnivorous diet experiment for myself. Um, so, some of the things I want to go over today are, you know, I've done some research on this topic. Um, there are only a couple of people that you could turn to. There's like three total. Largely, my decision um, is based on really one person's testimony because she had an outcome similar to one that I am interested in. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the things that have been reported in these N equal 1 experiments that have been going on all across the fucking internet when it comes to carnivore diet. Um, I do have a, a carnivore that, a bunch of carnivores that regularly are telling me the, the results they're getting um, right here on this channel. But in addition to that, I've gone out to see what other people who have tried it. And there ain't a lot of the motherfuckers right now. Gee, I wonder why that is. And, you know, my journey has brought me from one issue to another trying to correct things. At first it started out as I wanted to get rid of the pre-diabetes that was creeping in, um, which meant getting rid of the weight, you know, according to old school dogma. So then I started out with intermittent fasting, um, which brought my weight down about 40 to 5 to 50 pounds, depending on if you count some uh, long fasts in there and whatnot. Um and eventually I you know I started to become super hungry and then I wanted to know why I was being so fucking hungry all the time when um, I've heard of people that that fast without as much hunger issues or binging post um, turns out the standard American diet not a good idea for that so then I jumped onto the keto bandwagon reluctantly because I was a sugar addict and a carb addict you know this is kind of a brief history in case new people come here um, eventually I discovered that those addictions go away the health continues to improve um, because the belly measurement also consistently stayed there i was in a one-year plateau um, despite long uh, stints on keto but simply because i was still drinking and i was still having a copious amount of cheat days in that process um, that that was keeping me from progressing further once i cut that down and i got rid of the alcohol my Measurement around my gut is in the 34 inch range and has stayed there consistently even though weight has fluctuated a bit here and there We'll get into that in a little bit, but Mainly I you know, I have my reasons for wanting to try this um, Aside from the channel um, I want to know how it affects me Mental health wise, which is one of the reasons I follow Amber or I follow Amber O'Hearn's story the most she is an eight year carnivore diet if anybody was gonna fucking drop dead from a carnivore diet it should be because they are on it for that long a period of time and she is perfectly healthy and more importantly she has completely reversed her mental health gotten off of her depression medications 
Um, she started out to, like everyone else, I'll lose weight so I can look fuckable. And then realized, holy shit, I feel good. Oh, fuck, I got to keep doing this. I don't, who gives a shit about that looking fucking great shit? I want to feel good. And that's where I'm at. I don't give a fuck about looking great. I don't care if I take my shirt off and people cry. I'm just going to be like, hey, I feel good. My health is good. My blood work great. You know, no problems. And I'm already pretty much most of the way there in that. There was a few is issues that I'm wondering what will happen when I do this. For example, cramps occasionally plagued me in my ketogenic lifestyle, especially with long fasts you know, sprinkled in here and there. Um... And of course, you know, the bowel issues. Sometimes I would have, you know, very liquidy shit or I would, you know, yeah, it, it wasn't pretty. Um, you know, and it was still, I had the same shitting pattern of every three days. Consequently, we'll get into that in a minute. There's already some changes because I removed veg for the most part, but there's a few plant-based things that are still in my life. But, you know, this is day one. I'm hunkering down and I'm eliminating some anything that has to do with plants for the next 30 days to see what happens. And then at the end of the 30 days, I will determine whether or not I stay carnivore or whether I go back to keto. Those are the options. There will be no return to carbs. Um, and there'll still be a minimization of the veg, you know, based on my glyphosate thing. And before you vegans get all your panties all up in a wad about this, you got to understand one thing. All right. Our plant based diets are fucked industrially right now. So unless you are raw, organic, super duper grow your own shit vegan. And even in that case, depending on where you live, it's still an issue. There is a big thing that I've been researching that's called glyphosate, and I've also been researching gut health. And when you put those two pieces of the puzzle in the puzzle, it doesn't look good for fucking plants. And I will be honest, my feelings have improved significantly since I've reduced, but not eliminated, the sources of glyphosate in my life. And I do believe eating a glyphosate-polluted animal is less glyphosate than eating the oh i just poured the shit all over my grains motherfucker so there's that um so that's just uh something to feed the the vegans who probably won't watch all the way through um so the, i was highly interested in amber o'hearn's journey because of her mental health progress and the fact that she reversed her depression feels even keeled she even went on to to describe um and, and actually, just let me show you a few clips of, of some inspiration to for those of you who might follow me. I Like I said, I don't recommend this. You don't have to follow it just because I'm doing it. You know, do your research. Be a free thinker. Consult a doctor if you have medication or health issues. I cannot figure out. This is my experiment that I want to do for myself. If you want to do a similar experiment, make sure you get all your ducks lined up. Make sure you're healthy to begin with or, you know, make sure that at the very least it won't affect your health. Now, I know some people are going to be like me and be like, I don't give a fuck, motherfucker. I'm going to try shit if I want to. I understand that. But I, the disclaimer is still there because... I'm just not an expert. I'm just a fucking asshole, and I don't want anybody doing anything based solely off what I fucking say. So, speaking of doing things based off of what people solely fucking say, um, it's Amber O'Hearn. Now, there's more than one, um, you know, figure in this community. I've come across three that stand out. Sean Baker, Amber O'Hearn. It's all fucking Sean Baker and shit. It's a bullshit. Where the fuck was that guy? So I did some quick uh, looking. He's a hard guy to find, um, which explains why he's only got 1,500 views 
you know, on his video, no, not a lot of people are looking to be fucking carnivores because it's so taboo. It's so against the dogma you know, of plant-based bullshit that, you know, it's so far outside of what the government, what the industry, what everybody wants us to eat that there's not a lot of motherfuckers doing this. But there's there's three people. Sean Baker's one of them, but I'm not a fan of Sean Baker necessarily because, you know, I don't know. I just can't. I, I, maybe I have ADD problems. I don't know. I can't get through his video before I, you know, my mind wanders. Um, the, but the, these other two that I'm, I'm uh, bringing up, they are pretty hardcore as well as Sean Baker, um, but because they're not doctors, they probably don't get as much attention. Like if you do a carnivore diet research, you're going to get a full page of Sean Baker. And it's all well and good. But I tend to like more than one motherfucker telling me the results instead of just one guy. Um, I do have a lot of anecdotal feedback from you guys. Um, I do have some anecdotal stuff I've stumbled across on the internet. But really my biggest sources of inspiration come in regards to addressing gut health problems and in addressing um our psychological problems and of which i've had a little of both not as much of the gut health problems you know i mean just the mainly the the bathroom issue um which i've heard changes significantly and i've observed a bit of a change already even though all i did was reduce the amount of plants i was consuming so the other guy is Zero Carb Journal is the name of his channel. Um, I just realized I'm not even subscribed to him. I kind of want to keep up with him. Um, that's in addition to, but my primary one, because honestly, she's the one I can find that did it the longest and had the most profound health results as far as mental health goes. Um, she wasn't suffering from any um, se seemingly you know, really bad immuno-related conditions. But the reason why I, I like this guy is he had severe immune problems. You know, he had lots of allergies. He had IBS. He had a severe health problem that cleared up completely just by being carnivore. Um, and he tells his story on his journal. So I recommend, if for those of you who are interested in research on this topic, even if you don't want to try it, or at least you want to understand why the fuck I'm doing it, um, these two people are people to watch. Um, so let's go through Amber O'Hearn. Now, Amber O'Hearn started off as a weight loss journey, like many of us. And quickly, she went to keto first. And then got to a point where she plateaued on keto and was still kind of wanting to really lose weight um, because of our aesthetic requirements. I, you know, that's a thing. Um, but as we get further into health, we start to realize that that's not as important. And that's kind of what happened in my journey so far. And that's exactly what happened to her. She's like, I'm going to do carnivore for a little while and, and make these last few pounds go away. Then while she was doing it, and at one point, you know, it was just after she was having a baby, so there's that, um, but she very quickly discovered, she had to go off her meds because she was pregnant, um, and then when she got done having the baby, she went completely carnivore, um, and then discovered because she went carnivore and she wasn't taking her meds that she felt fine. She didn't need to go get the meds. And for eight years, she's been carnivore ever since because she didn't want to go back to the meds and she likes feeling normal. Um, so the first thing that people report is mood stabilization. You get some of this on keto, um, but not all the way. And I can attest to that. Um, there are things that happen in, see, depression is triggered usually by negative things that happen in your life. And I've had some negative things happen in my life. Um, some of which I still ruminate about, which can cause me to feel down. Um, but the, the difference is to how far into the pit of fucking misery you fall when these things happen. Um, it is okay to be legit bummed or sad about something that requires that amount of emotion. 
but it's not okay if it sends you off the rails for weeks at a time into a fucking pit of I don't want nothing to do with anything because this world sucks and is horrible and I want to fucking die. If it sends you down into that realm, you suffer from depression. If you just get bummed for a day or two and then you start to feel a little bit better, but maybe not quite happy for a while, or maybe you're bummed for a while because it's a long-term, highly traumatic event, um, but you don't get in, you're still functional, you can still do everything you need to do, you, you know, um, I attribute it to someone close to you passed away, yet you're still highly functional, you're able to do everything, you just, regardless of the sadness, whereas depression, you don't want to do anything, you don't want to feel, you, you just want to lay in bed and sleep it off. Um, a lot of the times. Um, so I understand as a, a person that suffered from depression my whole life, and I noticed an improvement on keto. I want to see, but I still get bummed, and I still probably, I feel like I'm still get down a little more than I should. So the thing I want to know is, will going carnivore make it just completely even keeled to where I'll, you know, if something bad happens, I'm sad in the moment or maybe for a few hours afterwards, but then I recover and am able to process the event in a more logical, functional way. Um, that's kind of where I'm at from the mental health side. The other issue I've been having is my bowl trips have been a little rough is before I went to carnivore is in it wasn't about constipation actually I was free flowing a little too free flowing um, there were moments of diarrhea there were moments of just a complete flushing out and there's two attributable things plants and artificial sweetener um, and you know we'll get over what I'm gonna do in the coming days for this diet and what my guidelines for myself will be but you know, so those are the two big issues and the cramps and that, you know, and that's something I'm really worried about with this diet. Um, but there's a lot of evidence, you know, about our vitamin and mineral requirements, A, changing, B, plants can prevent absorption of minerals. And a big factor in that is glyphosate because glyphosate binds to minerals and will make them useless to you. Um, so there's that. But overall, I'm curious, you know, will I become deficient? I have another blood test coming up next year. Um, and if I end up sticking carnivore, it'll be interesting. Um, but it all boils down to, A, is it sustainable for me? Will I be happy eating this way? And B, do I get the results that I'm looking for? Um, which have nothing to do with weight loss. So... That being said, I'm curious what will happen with my weight. Will I gain weight? I'm anticipating maybe yes, because there's going to be a lot more protein in there than I usually consume um, because of the higher quantities of meat. Um, that means I'm going to have more glycogen storage, so that's interesting. So I'm probably going to put on some water weight, I would think. I'm Now, every indication is you remain catotic during this, so it's weird. You know, yes, you might pump out a little more glycogen um, and store up a little bit more because you have more available from the the excess protein that you're not using to rebuild, especially if you're not athletic. Um, whereas if you're athletic, you're probably utilizing most of the protein for building. Um, so there, there's that aspect. What will my weight do? More important to me is what will the fucking tape measure do? Um, so I'm, I'm curious about that. And I want to see how that works out. So let's let's uh, warm up a little with uh, some Amber O'Hearn. Here to prevent scurvy, which is very small, like I think ten grams, and then the rest of it is just based on this it's about idea that C. maybe we actually need more antioxidants. It's very vague. Mm. So the thing that's really interesting about vitamin C is that the uptake of vitamin C in cells is goes on the same receptor as glucose. And so mm -hmm. they're kind of in competition. And if you suddenly are taking away all that glucose that you would have on a high carb diet, it seems that the amount of vitamin C that is necessary to meet all your needs becomes much lower because it's mm. not in competition anymore. That's, that's interesting. The other thing about vitamin C is that if you go to your standard USDA database to find out how much vitamin C you're getting, especially on a carnivorous diet, it's going to tell you that beef contains no vitamin C. 
Right. And that's just flat out wrong. Right. And I, if you look at the the um, publication, there's there there's big long publications that go with all the RDAs showing where they came up with them, and there are tables that show how they how they measured for each thing. Um, how much of each nutrient is in there. And mm -hmm. if you look at the table for vitamin C in beef, it says zero and and the little footnote saying assumed zero. So they never actually mm -hmm. measured it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's just crazy because they didn't do it with fish. They acknowledge that fish has some vitamin C. And just historically, it's it was known by Arctic explorers that meat would cure scurvy. Mm. So it's a kind of now this is somebody who has done extensive homework on the subject given talks on it um and researched the topic and has practiced this for eight years without getting fucking scurvy that's enough evidence f for me to feel comfortable trying it um you know there's always the chance that she might not be telling us all of her health issues and that's fine and ultimately, it comes down to us to figure out if this works for us or not. However, that is the thing that I've been coming up repeatedly. You know, um, Dr. Weston Price, I think it was, you know, who spent time with the Inuit and uh, the Maasai and many other meat-only societies that had none of the diseases that, you know, in prevalence that we have today as far as heart disease, diabetes, all of those issues. And... You know, they weren't having mineral deficiencies. They didn't have scurvy. Um, in fact, their dental health, because the guy was a dentist, was obscenely great. This was the first evidence I, you know, come across. And it was so much, he believed in it so much, he came back here and had them study him while he ate only meat for a year, supervised. He, I think he locked himself up in a ward where and he ate only meat, and they let him they let them study him. That was the first significant evidence in the modern times of what happens when we stop eating fucking plants and shit? Um, since those days, the plants in our diet have become much more fucked up be by the industrial chemical farming that we are doing to destroy the mineral content, to destroy the nutrition, probably leaving you with pretty much anti-nutrition without a whole lot of vitamins and minerals to go with it. Um, and plants have a quality that can prevent absorption of vitamins and minerals in some plants depending on what you're eating am i saying all plants are bad no am i saying plants in our grocery stores are bad yeah pretty much all of them have some kind of contamination in this department or are grown in very nutrient deplete soil this is a united states problem however i think there's other areas in the world that are just as glass glyphosate saturated as we are and who don't you know they put out these big monoculture farms that don't properly recycle you know animals you know over the the soil to replenish the nutrition of the soil um that we use chemicals and sometimes human shit um and cow shit and you know I, we i don't know i don't know if we use human shit but we use cow shit definitely and as fertilizer for soil um and these are factory farmed cows that are fed you know glyphosate no to no tomorrow and we try and rebuild the soil the soil nutrition yet where our plants if you look at, at the ingredients list on uh, in a salad um you'll notice that there's not a whole lot of vitamins and minerals to be had there um, so you add that in with the fact that you're not absorbing as much. There's that. And another point she made is our U.S. recommended daily allowances, which, by the way, are how have our guidelines been doing in all the other areas of nutrition? But leaving that aside, that's some conspiracy theory shit. Our guidelines were formulated based on a high carbohydrate diet. And one of the biggest things that every carnivore that I've researched so far has had in common is that basically your requirement, your U.S. recommended daily requirement for vitamins and minerals changes largely based on the types of foods 
that you're eating. Your metabolism shifts. You require a different vitamin set for a high-carb diet than you do for a low or no-carb diet. The other misconception is that there's no nutrition in meats, and meats are very packed with vitamins and minerals that we need and use. Eggs are a superfood, for example. That's the equivalent of eating organ meat, as I've been researching. Um, you get a lot of nutrition that way, um, not just from muscle meats. Lean muscle meats are at the bottom of the carnivore food chain. You want fatty cuts. You want ground beef with a lot of fat in it. You want a lot of normally fatty meats. Um, if you're eating poultry, obviously you want the fattier dark meat as opposed to the, the lean breast meat. Um, so, the, the, you know, these are all things to think about when, when adopting this. But um, she's pretty awesome. And another, uh, for those of you, I've already mentioned this video once before, but at Keto Fest 2017, she gave a nice speech. Um, let's, let's look at a clip of that. Fiber and antioxidants and toxins and snowflakes. Okay, so the strategy for herb herbivores is that they eat copious amounts of low quality forage and they eat continuously and they process repeatedly, which I'll get back to. When I say low quality, I'm not making a value judgment. Some nutritional ecologists have used this to try to quantify diets in herbivores. These were some scientists studying primates who came up with this formula where basically you have the percent of plant structural parts plus two times the reproductive parts plus three and a half times the animal prey in their diet to, as a way to determine quality. And the other thing that is not widely recognized, you think of herbivores as eating plants so they must be getting most of their energy from carbohydrates, right? But actually mammals most of the food that herbivores eat is actually fiber, and mammals can't digest fiber. But microbes can. Microbes can ferment fiber into microbes, or into short-chain fatty acids, so acetate, propionate, and butyrate. And that's where they get almost all of their energy. And then those short-chain fatty acids are further converted into ketones and some glucose and saturated monounsaturated fat. There are basically two ways that they do this. If you think about your digestive system, there are basically four parts. There's the stomach, which breaks things down, and the small intestines, which does the absorption, and then the large intestines. So I recommend that from, uh, that was on Two Keto Dudes channel uh, from Keto Fest 2017. And the takeaway, the reason I picked that clip is another kind of nail in the coffin of plants in our diet that has got me pretty well convinced um there's two things to that um first of all first of all herbivores have a completely different di digestive system than we do they have these huge you know multiple stomachs um for example a cow that eats veg all day because for you oh what do you think fucking cows eat motherfucker you know, it turns out that they aren't, they're taking all of that grass that they're chewing, they're processing it in their stomachs, breaking it down, then regurgitating it into their fucking mouth, chewing it some more, throwing it back in, and that process can happen for days. Then once that's done, it goes into their cecum, where their digestive bacteria ferments it, and the end byproduct of all of that carbohydrate is fat so we essentially cows are eating fat they're just busting their fucking ass to get there because they have to that's their digestive system that's what they have to eat believe me if cows could get the same thing had a digestive system like us they'd be eating the little animals that are running out out there however their digestive system wouldn't be able to digest that because it's set up to foment and to get them fatty acids from the undigestible fiber we also do not digest fiber we don't that's why you think you can why do you think you can do the net carb thing because that net carb is the difference and what's happening is those carbs that you don't count in your carbohydrate intake are actually 
being taken into your body as fat. However, we are not as good at it as a herbivore. We can get the job done. We got a little bit of space to make this happen. Um, chances are you're going to shit most of it out in the end. Hence, you pump a bunch of fiber in, you have to take a big steam and dump. That's part of the process. Now, we convert our fiber to fat. And we feed all the microbes in our gut with that fiber, the ones that feed off of that. So the question that comes into mind for the experimental part is, is, is how do, uh, does our gut microbiota, how does that re, you know, change over the course of a, key, or of a carnivore diet? Um, so that might change our nutrition, and it might change it for the better. Um, turns out, you know, if we're getting our energy from these microbes that are fermenting this fiber, what happens when you start taking that fiber away, which you'll be doing on a, on a carnivore diet? Obviously, the microbes that did the job are gone, but the requirement for them to do the job is probably gone too, because we got the fat coming directly in. We can just grab the fat, and this is another reason why you digest most of the meat and fat you eat. You don't have a lot of coming out of the other end, unless there's something that's wrong with the meat. Um, you know, any fiber that you take in will still be in there, and you do, you know, utilize that with your gut, but the end result is a high fat diet. However, carbohydrates aren't part of that process. Carbohydrates get right in there, and then they get converted to fat after your glycogen's full. So, when your glycogen's full, any carbohydrates you eat are converted by the liver to fat. You know, there's no fermentation. I'm talking about fiber there. That happens in the gut. Sugar and carbs get in. And they go to the liver. You know, well, the glucose just goes into the blood. You know, it has no problem there. But the fructose has to go to the liver. And then that gets converted. It all goes through the liver at some point. Um, so, you know, that's the other thing to think about. You know, why am I eating these fucking plants when all I'm doing is making fat the hard way in the end with all the fiber? And, you know, maybe I could just skip the, the whole middle, man. Just eat the fucking fat to begin with. You, you know, there's that aspect of it. Um, I'm not, I've never, I lived a long time with very low vegetables in my diet, even on the standard American diet. You know, I, you know, I got a lot of potatoes, I got a lot of starches, I got a lot of breads and pastas, but when it came down to salad greens and fruits, not uh, hardly any. Occasionally I'd have a salad with my shit. Um, but not every day, definitely, and maybe once a week sometimes, maybe if that, once every couple weeks, uh, or there'd be lettuce on one of my fucking burgers. But overall, I didn't have any nutritional deficiencies other than the vitamin D thing from not being outside, and uh, there's some argument to be made that the reason your vitamin D drops is because of the amount of vegetables you eat. I am not currently vitamin D deficient since being keto, so there's that. So I don't know how much weight can be put in that department, so to speak. But, you know, there's there's a significant amount of information, data, and anecdotal data. You know, there's not a lot of clinical because there's no place that's taking patients and putting them on carnivore. You know, there just isn't. Um, there are some zero carb treatments out there that were mainly to treat IBS. Basically, they needed fiber free diets. And of course, that meant that their carbs mainly were probably coming in with no fiber, hence the standard American diet. Um, but any healthy motherfucker that was trying to be healthy was getting shit tons of fiber and having digestive problems. There's reports of gas. There's reports of, you know, stomach pain and intestinal pain and, you know, the leaky gut thing. And this is all, you know, related to the glyphosate issue as well. Um, but plants probably aren't helping the matter anyway. If anything, if you take the glyphosate out of the picture, plants are probably a little less than benign, benign due to their own chemical defenses because that's their only way of surviving is to defend themselves against people eating them and they can't run away but they definitely can fight chemically and there are many plants that will kill us if we eat them 
So we have a range. There's a spectrum. There's plants that'll fucking kill you. Then there's plants that will make you feel not so good, but you'll probably recover. Then there's plants that, oh, that kind of doesn't really hurt that much. Our body can handle whatever the fuck it's throwing at us. At best, that's where our dietary plants can be when you take all the chemical farming out of the picture is uh, you can eat it. Your body will deal with the, the negative chemicals that the plant does and the nutritional things that can it can block. Um, so in the end, that's the best case. So there's no requirement in there. You notice that? There's no real requirement to eat plants. Contrary to our guidelines and nutritionists and all these motherfuckers, Every piece of evidence I've looked into so far has indicated, not to mention my own personal limited plant consumption throughout my life. Um, some could argue I was supplemented with all the vitamins that they inject into bread and pasta and all of that shit. Um, and they do, and because they have to, because they want us to eat less meat. We got to get our fucking stuff somewhere, and it's you got to eat a lot of that to get the same amount you get from a, a good meat or egg. You know, vegans will argue with me on that, too. So, you know, there's mounting evidence in my eyes based on the research I've been doing. And I've been researching for three years. It's not the first time this has popped up. Usually when the carnivore thing popped up, I was like, I can't fucking do that. I don't want to fucking do that. I, I like my spinach. I like my nuts. I like, you know, all of these keto foods that would be eliminated in that process. Not to mention the artificial sweetener. Um... So th there were all of these things that I wanted to keep in my diet. So those are the, th you know, three videos you will find linked in the description. Be sure and check them out. Zero Carb Journey was, you know, if you have uh, Im autoimmune problems, uh, the, the Zero Carb Journal I would recommend. He's been on, uh, on it for at least a year, if not longer. Um, he lives out in the wild from what I can tell, has his own game, has his own, you know, um, garden, um, so, you know, to feed the game, I assume, since he's carnivore, um, but, you know, he lives off the land and lives off his own livestock, as far as I can tell, um, so there's that, you know, I don't know, as far, you know, there's, I only watched a couple of his videos, I got a lot, pretty, pretty big research, uh, pile of stuff I gotta go through, um, so I, I can't focus too long on one person, but I do every once in a while I'll revisit his channel and watch his videos, but he was inspiring with his autoimmune results and I'm pretty healthy autoimmune wise, even, um, while well, I'll get into that at the end of the video, uh, there's something that happened that may have traumatized my autoimmune system over the weekend, but we'll get into that. Stick around if you want to hear more of that shit. So check them out. There's that. So what am I going to do for the next 30 days that is different from what I normally do? Chocolate's out of the picture. Everything I eat, with one exception, that will be coffee. I'm not cutting out coffee. Fuck you. It's not going anywhere. Coffee is, is such a crutch and such a big part of my life. I realize there's glyphosate in it. I realize it's not the best choice. I, I've switch to organic coffee to hopefully minimize that but you still get the water and whatnot um i use bottled water when i do it so i'm getting some plastic water instead of some glyphosate water hopefully um i'd be interested to know you know spring fed certain spring fed bottlers that whether or not they are subject to the glyphosate pollution or maybe it's below a threshold that we can tolerate um, in any case, I use bottled water in my coffee. I don't use tap water, um, especially here. And, you know, organic coffee. Three Sisters, I believe it's called. I don't know the, the name of the company. Um, maybe I'll do a video on that one day and link it or something. So, coffee is staying. Chocolate, 100% chocolate, um, is going. So, that's out. Nuts are gone. I've already kind of been doing that just to kind of get used to the idea and now that I've been doing it a while a couple weeks um since I've had oh wait no I did it was one night I had pecans um so there is that but for the most part nuts are gone also no more halo top ice cream 
no keto baked goods. I had my last keto baked good yesterday, by the way, because it was Easter and my mother made a big prime rib dinner. Consequently, I probably ate over a pound of, of prime rib, um, and that was twice last week. Um, I went out to dinner one day and had a 20-ounce prime rib. Um, and boy, the look on their face when I just told them, nope, that and a lobster tail I had, I, I ate them. I didn't have any problem eating the whole fucking thing. And I'm still 189.8 right now, which it went up. You know, I, was, I got down to 188 at one point. No significant, you know, one meal a day eating is how I've been eating most of, most of these past couple of weeks um, on keto and very low veg keto. Like we're talking probably under 30 grams per day of carbs level where I'm used to allow myself up to 50. Um, so I lowered my carb count content significantly by just dropping veg um, and most plant-based products. And so I've already kind of warmed up a little for this uh, carnivore experiment just to see, you know, as I remove certain foods, how I feel about that and do I crave them. Consequently, my craving for nuts has gone down. Um, my craving for chocolate hasn't, so there's some some gut bacteria in there somewhere going, hey, motherfucker, we like chocolate. Make some motherfucking chocolate and shit. And I need to, you know, let those guys die off for a little bit as I don't take in chocolate. So, basically, my rules are this. Coffee is allowed and anything animal-based is allowed. Spices are allowed as far as pepper, salt, you know, seasoning, and some seasoning contains some plant matter, but I would argue very little. Um, mostly salt and pepper um, is to season with, you know, and because I like salty things. You know, I like a little bit of flavor added to my meat. You know, I can eat it without it, too, um, if it's, especially if it's rare. But um, as far as, you know, seasoning, I like a little variety. And one of the ways you get variety, especially with eggs... Um, is seasoning. So I do that. Um, also, in addition to that, I will occasionally have buffalo sauce, you know, which has zero carbs in it. Um, so that's a little not healthy, but it's going to make the diet have a little more variety than it otherwise would. Um, artificial sweetener. This is the big one. This is going to be the hard one for me. Um, I've been addicted to artificial sweetener for a while now. Um, I sweeten my coffee. I've, I've cut it in half. I put one packet in a cup of coffee, two in a large, huge cup of coffee, um, and that seems to suffice. But every once in a while, I try drinking without it, and, I'm, and I just keep going back. This 30-day challenge it will include no artificial sweetener. I want my palate to completely reset. I want to be able to taste the slightest hint of sweetness in anything I eat. And that's not going to happen if I'm constantly pounding the artificial sweetener. Now, it's not really artificial. It's stevia and erythritol. Erythritol being more artificial. It's derivative of corn. It's a sugar alcohol. It causes all kinds of gut problems and gas. Um, stevia has its own realm of issues depending on your research. You mix the two and that's what I've been doing for sweetener it's not like uh, I do I don't do aspartame I don't do sucro, sucralose anymore occasionally I did I ran across it but it was very rare I usually carry packets of the other stuff with me when I'm out and about well I'm hoping to eliminate the need to do that um, so it'll be interesting to see as I go through the withdrawal period from sweetness um, now there is a little sweetness left to me in this diet because I am allowing my I'm not going to be strictly a meat guy um, there's going to be dairy there's going to be eggs there's going to be cheese and of course full fat Greek yogurt is going to be my go-to dessert um, I've been sweetening in that with one packet of, of you know Splenda Naturals which is stevia erythritol with nothing else in it I started today, I had a small bowl of it just because I didn't want to waste it if I didn't, wasn't happy with it, um, without the sweetener, and I found it still felt a little sweet. You know, it, it, you know, it, it, it had a hint. You know, it's like, this is almost sweet, motherfucker. Um, just keep at it. We'll, we'll, you'll, get, you'll acquire this taste. This is an acquirable taste. Um, so 
that's where I'm going with, you know, the whole artificial sweetener. I want to desensitize myself over this next 30 days so that I no longer have to walk around with little fucking packets in my pocket. I can just put some heavy cream in my coffee, get my fat delivered that way. I still believe in having a decent amount of fat in this diet. Um, there'll be plenty of butter, just no plant-based fats at all. And that's where the difficulty eating out is going to be. Um, I know I'm occasionally going to get snuck by the lovely establishment of food that are out there. I'm pretty careful about it now. I've been trying to avoid vegetable oil for a while. But every once in a while, I'll eat something with vegetable oil. And I've been avoiding it so long that I can taste the fucking vegetable oil. If I eat chicken wings fried in a fucking vat of vegetable oil, I taste that shit in the chicken wings. That's why I go for char-grilled now. Um, so there's that. So I try to avoid vegetable oil wherever possible. However, sometimes when a place is preparing steak or they serve you a side of margarine, I mean butter, they call it butter, but it's fucking margarine. Some of these places are substituting for butter. Um, and ultimately, I, I don't eat out often, but I know there's going to be occasions, especially when I'm on the road, that I do. And so there's that. Now this... 30 days is going to extend into my Carolina Rebellion trip. And I've been going back and forth quite a bit on whether or not I want to have a cheat weekend for that. And ultimately, after a lot of thinking about it, I'm not going to cheat through Carolina Rebellion. I, you know, every time I contemplate the fact that I haven't had a cheat day in so long... I kind of don't want one. I feel good. I crave the foods that I currently can eat. I love the, you know, the carnivore stuff that I eat and will look forward to it. Um, if I get up and wander to the refrigerator in the middle of a day for a snack, I'm not going out there looking for sugar and carbs. I'm going out there for cheese curds. Um, sometimes I'll do some junky ass, nasty ass pork rinds with some fucking, um, you know, French onion dip. Consequently, both of those are animal products with a few unhealthy elements thrown in here and there. Um, so there's those. I'm not going to lean heavily on that shit. Um, there's still going to be parts of the diet, though, as a carnivore, and I think they should be because they, they do fulfill a requirement mentally for me um, as a snack food that, that you know, may not be optimally healthy, but at the same time, I tolerate it just fine, and on, ar arguably, I think my gut's repaired to the point where I tolerate most dairy without a problem. Um, I used to have to run to the bowl. Um, that has subsided. Um, I can eat dairy no problem. Um, I can even drink a glass of milk without getting sent to the bowl. I don't drink milk, by the way. I've, I've given that up. I haven't wanted to go back to just drinking milk. I used to have a glass every now and then, um, but not anymore. You know, I throw heavy cream in my coffee, and that's pretty much the closest to milk as I get is heavy cream. Um, I don't really drink heavy cream on its own. don't think I would enjoy it. Um, but I have some had a heavy dose of it in my coffee to where it was probably almost more heavy cream than coffee in some cases. Uh, so there's that. So that's what I'm doing for the next 30 days. And at the end of that 30 days, I will sit down here in front of this fucking camera and tell you what I think, what happened, what, how I felt, um, things I missed, things I craved, whether or not I can continue to go on with the diet because of the things I miss and crave. That's the biggest uh, factor there as far as is it sustainable. Um, the social aspects, there's going to be some new social aspects. Um, people are already uncomfortable when you tell them you're keto. What happens when you tell them you eat only meat? What happens if you're on an animal-based diet? What happens? You tell them you're a carnivore, they just think you all oh, you eat lots of meat. If you tell them you're on an animal-based diet, that removes any doubt to the fact that you're not eating vegetables at all, or grains at all, or legumes at all, or tubers at all. Nothing from fucking plants. The plants will grow. And I'm saving the planet because I'm not mowing down tons of fucking natural habitat to make huge fucking fields to feed all of the vegans in the world. I just know that there's some vegans I'm going to be poking when I uh, do this experiment. Um, 
And if you're a vegan subscriber of mine, I apologize. You know, this is something I want to do. And, you know, I understand if you move on. But if you're curious, stick around. If you have an open mind, stick around. See what it does. Maybe I'll, maybe you'll get to point and laugh over my dead body at the end of this. I don't know. But at the very least, you should be curious enough to, to see what the other side of the equation really is. And, you know, it's... I've never been a big fan of vegetables, you know, that I like, there's a few that I really like that are, were a staple of my ketogenic diet, but for the most part, I didn't have a lot of variety there. It's mostly leafy greens. I was a big fan of, of buttered spinach, um, you know, but I think I was more of a fan of the butter than the spinach. I think I put butter on just about anything and I like it. Um, and I put butter on my meats. If I eat a particularly lean cut of meat, it'll have a shit ton of butter all over it. Um, so I'm getting my fats, whether I'm eating lean meat or not. Um, I was put at the end. I was putting butter over salads instead of salad dressing. I would just butter, salt, and season the salad, and I was eating it like that. So, but I don't have to do that anymore. And that's the other thing I'm looking forward to about the diet is it's really easy. You know, there's meat everywhere. No matter where you go, it's just whether or not it's got fucking carbs caked on it and whether it was soaked in vegetable oil. Um, I try to avoid the vegetable oil shit, which is hard. That's the hard part of this. But in the end, if someone's got a grill and they're grilling, you're probably all right. You know, if you're walking around one of them fucking unhealthy food events and you see a grill with some fucking burgers sitting on it, chances are you can eat that shit. Same thing for hot dogs. Hot dogs not being a healthy necessarily thing but it'll get the job done when you're out and about socially um there's been events i've gone to where you get the hot dogs are easy and the people sell them for that reason um you just throw the bun away eat the hot dog you're good to go um don't put ketchup on or none of that shit um so there's no sugary sauces allowed on this for me i'm still holding to the the carb rules um, but there is a little bit of carbohydrate content in some meats, particularly if there's cold cuts. Those are still allowed. They're considered a junk food, I believe, in a carnivore diet. And that's that's it. That's my diet. You know, basically it's keto with no plant products except for coffee. That simple. It's not a hard diet to follow. Question is, is it a hard diet to follow? So I'm going to be like, I can't do that, too restrictive, blah, 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 blah. But how do you know? And that, that's my question. I've been saying that. I've been like, I can't fucking do that. It's too restrictive. I don't think it would be lifelong, blah, 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 blah. I talk all this shit, but I need to fucking, uh, there's enough data now for me to give it a try and see what happens. And that's what I encourage from all of you. So, wish me luck on my carnivore journey. In other news, I mentioned something happening over the weekend, which probably may have affected my health a little bit. Um, so, my buddy, as you know, has a couple of kayaks, and he wanted to go kayaking. And it's it was a 50-degree day, but it still hasn't been very warm. It's like 30-something today. So the water is definitely cold. So, it's, you know, me being the smart fucker I am, I just came fully dressed, jeans, fucking, you know, motherfucking hoodie. That's, you know, I dressed as if I was walking a trail, not how as I should be. You know, I did put water shoes on, thankfully. But you can see where I'm going with this. I'm kayaking again. And shit. See, when you play with your phone and you end up in the trees. Quiet. <laughs> no, you're not. You're taking selfies. Anyway, I'm back on the water thanks to my baller friend. Hey, what's going on? And uh, it feels good to get out here and into nature again. Well, it's natural as the fucking Neary Canal is. So, getting some exercise too for all you. Fuck Master Pounders. This is a good workout. Although I think the current just died. I thought there was a current. I guess we got no current, so it's a mild workout. We're just sitting here talking while we wait for him to play with himself. Ah, he's getting ready to go. I didn't bring enough gear to film the whole thing, so we're just gonna get like a little snippet and shit. 
so we get out there on the water and of course i wanted to film some of it and the only thing i had with me because i didn't bring any gopro mounts or anything was my phone so i was filming some with the phone you know you can see some footage here of, of me doing that you know and it was basically i was trying to you know be a little tell a little bit of the story about being able to get out on the water again and how good it feels and all of that now in order to do this, I wanted to be able to get some footage of myself. So I, you know, we paddled up. Then it was a little rough trying to, to get close enough together to hand him my phone without dropping it in the fucking bottom of the water. That would have been expensive as fuck. So I gave him the phone and I had, you know, I had a, did a pass so he could film me. And then I wanted my phone back. And this is where things went horribly wrong. So I paddled back up to try and get close, and then I reached out to try and pull our boats together, our kayaks. And as I reached, it seemed like he drifted away a little. My center of gravity went past that point of no return. And in, in as if it was slow motion, it was like... And... All I could think in slow motion was fuck. And into, this was on the Erie Canal, into the Erie Canal, which is not the cleanest, happiest water on the planet. Thankfully, it hasn't been growing much yet. It's for kind of a stagnant water, not a very flowing water. Into the muck of this water I went. I had a big mouthful come in, too. Cold would be an understatement. This was probably the coldest I've ever been in my life. I was barely able to get it. Thankfully, it's not. It, it was a little deep in the middle where I fell in. But as I got to the shore, I was able to stand up, which thankfully because my clothes were like sponges and I was significantly weighed down by the hoodie in particular. Thankfully, I didn't have sh my normal shoes on, or I probably wouldn't have been able to swim. Um, and I would have had to walk while holding my breath to the shore, hopefully in the right direction. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to see shit because this water is dirty as fuck. So I had a big mouthful of dirty-ass water, and I was cold enough to, that I could easily achieve hypothermia. So I got out to the shore. The The walking path along the canal was fucking, you know, it was full of people. You know, and a couple of them stopped to watch me damn near drown. You know, they, they looked like they were ready to jump in if I looked like I wasn't going to make it. Um, the, the kayak was floating. I, was, I wasn't worried about that. I just needed to get the fuck to the shore because it was fucking cold. It was windy out a little bit. You know, not super windy, but windy enough that when I got out... <laughs> That didn't help. I immediately knew I had to try and remove as much of the wet clothes as possible, even though that was only going to make me get very cold because of the wind. But eventually the, the wind would dry parts of me off that would help keep it going, um, and so as opposed to staying in the cold-ass, very wet hoodie, which I believe would have just cooled me even further. So, I was pretty much in mild hypothermia territory. I did get the euphoria that you can experience during that, followed by the plummet in energy. Um, and it was a mile and a half walk back. He hooked the, you know, he had my phone still, so I couldn't film at that point. He hooked the kayaks together with a paddle so that he could tow the other one back and spent the next mile and a half shaming me <laughs> i mean he was he was laughing about it. it it was entertaining and i probably would have done the same thing had it been him that went in so i have no hard feelings about him we're, we're a ball busting friendship we bust each other's chops quite a bit um and he he was said he was it was making his day because each person i passed was just like staring at me like i was the dumbest motherfucker on the planet as i walked in soaking wet clothes for a mile and a half back to the car um, thankfully, the sun had beat through the windshield of the vehicle, and I got in and filmed this. So, 
I just took a nice, really, really cold dip in the Erie Canal. Just trying to hand my phone o or get my phone back after filming that sequence you just watched. And over I went. Took my shirt off, it was wet as fuck. What's up, buddy? This guy's been feeling? laughing his ass off for the whole walk of fucking shame. Really busy walking path along the Erie Canal. I'll tell you what, I am totally warm. Warm as can be. Suck my cold <laughs> fucking shriveled balls in my shriveled up penis. Oh, God, it could not happen to a better person. Oh. See? Yeah. Woo! So, yeah. Good time, Scott. I think I just burned a few F thousand extra calories because I was cold. But I didn't die. It's really nasty water, though. Pretty sure there's glyphosate in it. And all kinds of other shit. Maybe even literal shit, I don't know. Oh, why don't you start the van up and get the heat on so you're not dying. literally dying. Where's the keys? Oh. Oh, fuck. So moral of the story, you know, there's always a lesson to be learned. If you're gonna go kayaking and it's still fairly cold, you might want to dress a little more appropriately instead of wearing a hoodie and jeans. Wear some wick and shit. I think I'd have been colder if I was wearing. Nah, you'd be dry already. Yeah. Fuck. Right, so that's what I did this weekend. <laughs> oh man, I hope I don't get sick. That would suck. So, all said and done, I lived. I, my energy crumpled. After I got warmed up, my energy dropped dramatically. Like, I felt like complete shit. I didn't really feel that nauseous, but there was a definite, I didn't feel good. I was not feeling well. Um... And I rested the rest of, of the day, even though I had other shit I wanted to do. That day I wanted to help a friend of mine who was playing, his band was playing somewhere. I was going to go try and shoot some video for practice for him. Um, but I ended up having to cancel that because I just, I couldn't do anything. I literally laid in my room. And that's what happened. Yeah, so I almost fucking died. Well, I didn't probably almost die. I don't think it was cold enough for rapid hypothermia. Um, but it was definitely, I definitely hit the mild range. Um, I didn't hit the uncontrollable shivering um, part of it, but it was, it was a shock to the system, um, both physically from the cold and from the contents of the water, which really skeeved me out. I took like two baths and two showers. Um, to try and get all of that out of my beard and out of, you know, everywhere where it probably went. I don't even want to think about it. Um, because that is not the cleanest canal in the world. And, uh, you know, wasn't meant for motherfucking. That's why you don't see people swimming in it. Um, so I, I feel I fully recovered from that. I don't seem to have any lingering ill effects. And that means I got a pretty good immune system that's dealing with all of that shit. And... You know, I guess moral of the story is if you have a good, strong immune system, you can tolerate some insult here and there because that was a big insult, I feel, to my health and my body. And I handled it. I had to have some recovery time, but it worked. And I'm back to full speed today. And I think if I was still a standard American diet eater, I would be violently sick right now. Because as you know, most people that get exposed that way end up catching a cold, so to speak, or becoming sick. Um, I have none of that problems. I was worried about it. I was like, dude, that every time in my distant past that something like that happened where I was super exposed to the cold um, and did not maintain adequate body temperature, that I ended up coming down with something in the days that follow. That's just not the case this time. So a victory for my immune system and my you know, liver or whatever the hell else is dealing with, whatever the hell was in that water that I got a big mouthful of um, when I went over. So there is that. Moral of the story, 
dress more appropriately if you're going to kayak in cold water. There's that. Is it going to stop me from kayaking? Fuck no. You know, it was an adventure. I enjoyed the adventurous part of it. And despite the hardship that happened during the adventure, it is a story now that is kind of I can look back on and be like, wow, that was one of the dumber things I did. And being able to have these experiences sets us up for success. We learn from our hardships and failures. If we never fail, if we're always trying to prevent shit from happening or we're always worried that something's going to happen so we never do stuff, that we miss out on the opportunity to occasionally fuck ourselves up. Not too bad, but recover and heal stronger and better than we were before. So what come out, comes out of this for me? I'm not as scared. You know, that was probably a worst case scenario for flipping a kayak over. So this summer when I'm out in the middle of the lake, I'll be like, oh, that ain't a big deal. Just grab onto the kayak and paddle my ass to the fucking shore. Hopefully the water's not freezing cold like it was that time. Um, and it won't be. So it, it definitely puts a new perspective on on the dangers of kayaking and whether or not I'm put off from it now. And I'm really not. You know, that was, it sucked at the time, but looking back, I feel it's prepared me for future adventures, of which there will probably be many. So, you know, I like to go, when he offers, I'll go, you know, and when he wants to go kayaking, I'm, I'm there, I'm ready to go. So, there's that. So I hope you enjoyed the little bit of footage that I shared. I figured I'd throw a little adventure thing at the end for those of you who stick around and tends to be those who you give a shit no matter what I do. Um, so there's that. So wish me luck on my journey. If you guys are carnivores already, I'm going to be joining you for a while. Maybe I'll stay. Who knows? If those of you who are thinking about it but not sure, maybe wait. See how I do with it. And then you'll have another testimonial, you know, anecdotal N equals one experiment with which to base your decision on. Um, and when you start to add up all the N equals ones, you have N equals many. And, you know, different data, different people, different personalities, different situations, that all can be kind of accounted for. Um, but the one thing they all have in common is certain ways of the diet. And that's what the commonalities you got to look for and try and adhere to those in your self experiment. N equals one and shit. But what the fuck do I know? I'm just a motherfucker that's going to say, I'm going to eat meat, and I'm going to like it. I'm on an animal-based diet. I can't wait to start throwing that term around everywhere I go. I'm on an animal-based diet. Because all you hear is plant-based, plant-based, plant -based, vegan, plant-based, plant-based, vegetarian, plant-based, plant-based. Plant I'm a fucking carnivore, motherfucker. I'm on an animal-based diet. I'm living off the motherfucking animals. And that's what I'm going to do. For the next 30 days, maybe longer. Animals have always been a big staple of my diet, no matter what I was eating. But now I'm going all in. I'm like, hey, motherfuckers, let's see how sustainable and how healthy I can be on an animal-based diet. And that, that's what I want to call it. I want to call it carnivore. Carnivore just means you like meat in my book. Um, when you tell somebody you're on an animal-based diet, you know... That's the opposite of a plant-based diet. That pretty much means you're the opposite of vegan at that point. And I kind of want to be the opposite of vegan. That's kind of a life goal of mine. I don't know why. I just, you know, it's called the, the vegan haters over the years have, have really tweaked me, I guess. So, I'm not a fucking expert. I'm just a fucking asshole. You know, don't do this in, if your health's bad or if you haven't consulted other sources other than me. This is my self-experiment, blah, blah, blah. Check with your doctor. If you're on medication especially, you know, because different medications do different shit to us. Um, so there's that. Um, and then if you do all that and you still join me on this journey, well, it's, it'll be nice to, that we can commiserate um, of our issues on this diet, especially socially. Because if you thought you got shit for fucking fasting, if you got shit for keto, wait till you tell motherfuckers you're on an animal-based diet. I guarantee you there's going to be a whole lot of, what the fuck? Don't you know you need vitamins and minerals and shit? How can you eat just fucking animals? There's no, you're going to have scurvy. You're going to fucking die. You're going to have a heart attack and scurvy and cancer and all of these things that we 
tell us to, from animals. You know, bacon. How can you eat bacon? Meanwhile, bacon only increased supposedly through the epidemiology that they did. The hard science, which wasn't hard. You know, it increases you about 17% according to their statistics. Um, not enough to be statistically significant by a hardcore drug standards as far as that goes for epidemiology um but that being said you're gonna hear all of that if you're go carnivore you're gonna hear you know you need carbs you need this you need vitamins you need that and that's in the, under the complete assumption that there's no vitamin content in meat that's fucking bullshit meat is very nutritionally dense and I would argue when you take the plants down a notch or eliminate them, that your requirements pretty much fall into line. That's the theory. I'm going to test it on myself over the next 30 days, maybe longer, depending on how I feel and what I miss and what I crave. Big thing for me is quitting the artificial sweetener, though. If you liked this video, you liked my shit, please like and subscribe. And let everyone know that you liked my shit. You know, repost it on Twitter or something. Don't bother with Facebook. Facebook doesn't let people see shit unless you pay them. Um, I think Twitter still lets you see shit without paying them. Which is, you know, all you have to do is that hashtag shit. So share it out to your friends. Say, look at this stupid ass motherfucker eating meat and falling in fucking polluted rivers and shit. I can't stop watching. When's, what's he going to fuck up next? Share it out. If this video brought you value, if I helped you somehow in your journey and you want to help support the channel, you can go to scottthetruckdriver.com and leave a donation in the tip jar. You can also go to Patreon. Both of those links are in the description and help me spend time doing this. But I'll always do this either way. So it's not a requirement, but if it helped and you want to say thank you in a certain way, there's a tip jar. Also, I haven't updated, I know I said I was going to do it, I haven't updated the affiliate links um, for Amazon yet. Uh, I will be getting to it soon. I have a lot on my plate right now for projects, so I'm working quite a bit, actually. So, there's that. So, sorry, vegans. I, I ain't mad at you, though. I still, still love you, I, but... Between us and animals, I'm choosing us and our health, especially mental health. Have a nice motherfucking day. And shit. I think I just lost all my vegan subscribers. I'm going to have a moment of silence. Okay, I'm done.